Tom Aron from Living Science Videos. When we look closely at a living cell, we see a miniature living system. Each part of a cell is vital to maintaining homeostasis to keep it alive. Two of the most fascinating organelles that we went over in an earlier video actually have their origins from somewhere outside the cell. The story of where mitochondria and chloroplasts come from is a fascinating window way back into the evolutionary history of cells one and a half billion to two billion years ago. The first person to name the study of how these cell structures found their way into cells was a Russian botanist named Konstantin Mirschkowski in 1910. He called it endosymbiotic theory, endon meaning within, syn meaning together, and biosis meaning living. He was familiar with the work of botanist Andreas Schimper, who had observed in 1883 that chloroplasts in green plants closely resembled that of free-living cyanobacteria. He noted in the footnotes of a paper he published about it that perhaps chloroplasts had come to live inside plant cells through a process called symbiosis. Symbiosis is a relationship between organisms where they live together, or organisms can actually live inside other organisms. We've already talked about how your body cells are outnumbered by bacterial cells living inside you. Now we're talking about bacteria living inside your individual cells. Sometimes a relationship is harmful to one of the organisms involved, or parasitic, like the fleas that can live off your dog's blood. This is why, if you read Spider-Man comics, the villain Venom's costume is called a symbiote, because it is an invasive parasite to its host. Only in that example you have to remember that the science is jacked up because it's just a comic book. In other times, the symbiotic relationship can be neutral or commensalist, giving no harm or benefit to the host organism, like a remora hitching a ride on a shark. But today we're talking about how chloroplasts in plants and their energy-producing counterparts, mitochondria, actually evolve inside the cell through endosymbiosis. In other words, scientists noticed as far back as the 1890s that chloroplasts bore a striking resemblance to cyanobacteria, and they hypothesized that they were originally ingested by their host and eventually became a functioning organelle inside plant cells. It would take 80 more years for American scientist Lynn Margulis to propose the endosymbiotic theory again. Her 1967 paper on the origin of mitosing cells was rejected by 15 scientific journals before being accepted by the Journal of Theoretical Biology. It wasn't the only time her determination was tested. She proposed some other hypotheses that were more controversial and not so well supported, so when she applied for a research grant she was told, Your research is crap. Do not bother to apply again. Still, she defended an advanced endosymbiotic theory against opposition because it was grounded in her observations and knowledge from research of other scientists who had pioneered the theory. Her work was vindicated in 1978 by Robert Schwartz and Margaret Dayhoff. They discovered that chloroplasts and mitochondria both had different DNA than was found in the nucleus of the cell they were a part of, and the type of DNA they had matched the profile of bacteria. Evolutionary biology often refers to a tree of life representing different branches or ancestral lineages which can be genetically traced. But the tree analogy really only works with eukaryotes. Prokaryotes, like bacteria and other single-celled microbes as well as viruses, can sometimes exchange genetic material with other microbes on contact in a process called horizontal gene transfer. Because we're not talking about an ancestor-descendant relationship, then it's not really evolution. It's a separate aspect and an added complication. The result is that the tree of life for single-celled microbes has branches growing back into each other in confusing ways. That's a lot harder to do with multicellular organisms, but it still happens on rare occasions. Some viruses, called retroviruses, insert their own DNA into the genome of the cells they infect. If this happens in a sperm or egg, then the developing organism will inherit the viral DNA sequence as part of its own genetic makeup. These copies of viral DNA are called endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs. Believe it or not, 8% of human DNA is actually old virus DNA. Your genome has a record of some 30,000 endogenous retroviruses inherited from past infections of your ancient ancestors. Where they are in your genome can be used to trace an evolutionary ancestry by comparing your genetic sequence to that of other people and even other animals. At least a few of your ERVs exactly match those found in apes in both type and location, indicating a common ancestor with this specific infection. So even with a small amount of horizontal gene transfer, the eukaryotic tree is still a tree. However, the tree of life seems to rise out of a network of simpler organisms that is more like a web than a tree, and on at least a couple of occasions, primitive eukaryotes didn't just absorb bacterial DNA, they engulfed the entire cell 
and incorporated it. The DNA of both chloroplasts and mitochondria is arranged in a circular chromosome like bacterial DNA, but not like eukaryotes. Mitochondria also divide by binary fission, just like bacteria do. Structurally, they even look like certain species of known bacteria. So what appears to have happened is that a prokaryote cell was engulfed by a larger primitive eukaryote cell and became part of its matrix. Perhaps it was a matter of timing. If the first ingested mitochondrion divided at the same time as the surrounding cell did, then both new cells might have these newly installed organelles. And of course the host cell would have incidentally provided for the guest cell while reaping the reward of all the energy it produced. This more efficient arrangement would have proliferated until eventually virtually every eukaryote cell had at least one mitochondrion in it, sometimes more because a mitochondrion can divide at other times too. The more mitochondria a cell has, the more energy they'll produce. Plants have both mitochondria and chloroplasts and they're both energy producing cells turned to organelles. The explanations of how mitochondria perform cellular respiration and how chloroplasts conduct photosynthesis will both require their own videos. But there's one more interesting feature about mitochondria that I want to explain now. All human cells have mitochondria, including your gamete cells, sperm, and eggs. But where the DNA and the nucleus of both cells are recombined in fertilization in an equal contribution from both mother and father, Male mitochondria are the exception. They're usually destroyed inside the egg so that they do not contribute to the genome and thus mitochondria is inherited only from the mother. You are a mixture of your mother's and father's genes and your parents are a mixture of all your collective grandparents genes and if any of them traveled from different places before they met then it can be difficult trying to trace your ancestry because you don't have just one ancestral lineage but many different interconnected ones. However, your mitochondrial DNA wasn't combined with everyone else's. It came from your mother's, mother's, mother, and so on. One unbroken matrilineal lineage, and that can be traced chemically. You can also trace your father's, father's, father's lineage through the Y chromosome, but that's a slightly different process. Every human zygote has an average of 128 mutations right from the point of conception. These are tiny, mostly trivial changes in your DNA. Significant mutations are rare, especially when they occur specifically in the mitochondria, but they do still happen every so often. These mutations are unique and serve as markers to distinguish your ancestral lineage from mine or anyone else's. But when we compare mitochondrial DNA from different groups of people, they start matching these older markers so that different groups are evidently related. This makes it possible to trace your maternal lineage because at some point, you and I had the same great-grandmother somewhere back in time. The further back in time you look at older mutations in your genes, the more people share the same great-grandmothers. When a particular mutation has spread to where it is shared throughout a population, it's called fixation. Fixation in non-coding DNA occurs at a fairly constant rate, roughly every 60 generations or thereabouts. This type estimate is known as the molecular clock. Through extensive genomic sequence analysis using the molecular clock and comparing ERVs and mitochondrial DNA from different groups of people all over the world, scientists have traced the migrations of ancient people and have determined that everyone living today shares a common ancestor, a single exponential great-grandmother who probably lived between 160,000 and 190,000 years ago. And our great-grandmother lived in Africa. She had grandparents too. There were other people living at that time, but all those other family lines eventually thinned out and terminated while her lineage continues in you and in me too.